Let's pray. pray. Heavenly Fathers, once again, dear Lord, we come to your throne, the grace and mercy, dear Lord. Just thank you, dear Lord, for allowing us to wake up to another beautiful day, dear Lord. Just thank you, Lord, for allowing us to come out here another portion of your divine word, dear Lord. Just, just, just thankful, dear Lord, that the saints can come together and worship you in spirit and truth. Dear Lord, we ask forgive us any sins we might commit against you, dear Lord, since the last time we ask. Dear Lord, we pray for those that's, that's sick, dear Lord, those who are, those that are in afflicted, dear Lord, those who are struggling, uh, not just in the body, but throughout the world, dear Lord. Uh, pray for those who have these issues with the COVID-19, dear Lord. Um, this pandemic is going to be here for a while, dear Lord, so we just going to be constantly ask you to be with us, dear Lord, as we go through this trying time. Dear Lord, we just uh, pray, dear Lord, that uh, as, as we continue to travel down this road, dear Lord, that you continue to guide us, dear Lord, so that we, not, that we won't make mistakes, dear Lord, um, and that we'll be a light unto the world. Dear Lord, we ask that uh, you grant the teacher the hour, uh, the, the knowledge and things that he studied, dear Lord, and that, that he bring it to us, dear Lord, in a simplicity that even a child would understand, dear Lord. Dear Lord, we just ask as we continue to go on with this this uh, service tonight that you be with us and we do things according to your will and way, dear Lord. We ask this prayer in your son Jesus' name. Amen. One once again. Thank you all for coming back out to our evening service, our worship, we are going through uh, Paul's letter to the saints in Colossae. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, this is, uh, by some characterizations, uh, the loftiest of Paul's uh, writings from a Christological standpoint. In other words, he spends a lot of time and a lot of effort um, on the nature of Christ Jesus and who Christ Jesus was, largely because of the, t largely because of the teaching that was going on there in Colossae. Let's go ahead and dig in. We've got quite a bit to cover. Uh, Lord willing, we'll cover uh, all of this. As mentioned before, we are going to be doing a verse-by-verse -verse lesson through uh, the Colossian letter and uh, looking at uh, what's going on there. We know that during this time, the Apostle Paul is in prison, and he is in uh, Rome, and uh, he hears about what's going on in Colossae, and I just wanted to have this area map so we can be a little bit familiar of some of the areas uh, that uh, was going on. This is all modern-day Turkey right now. You see Tarsus, which was Paul's home. You see Antioch of Pisidia, where Paul preached in uh, Acts chapter number 13. Uh, you see uh, Lystra, Iconium, and Derbe. Uh, those were the uh, uh, areas of Galatia that Paul uh, wrote to in the Galatian letter. And so you can see Smyrna, Sardis. Uh, you see all of the different areas uh, that are uh, in and around um, the um, um, uh, what we call Asia Minor uh, in, in our uh, biblical vernacular, but it's really just uh, looking at an area that today is called uh, Turkey. We zoom in a little bit and we see how Ephesus was at the mouth of the Mediterranean and how a lot of the commerce and everything came in through uh, Ephesus, you see Miletus, where we remember that Paul uh, uh, wrote or met with the Ephesian elders there. We see Pergamum, Smyrna, Thyatira. Those are the churches that are mentioned in the book of Revelation. And then we see here the Royal Road, which was constructed by the Romans. Uh, that brought a lot of commerce as it came through this major port city of Ephesus, where the Apostle Paul spent three years, and it would spread east. And so uh, Colossae was right on that, ru that route, even though you find there was a, a river, the Lycus River Valley, and the uh, Meander River, which was, uh, the Lycus was a tributary of it. You can see there how uh, uh, Colossae was centered uh, in this trade route, so there was a lot of people, a lot of commerce, uh, a lot of things um, uh, happening there. And then we get a little closer, yet still, we zoom in, and again, we see... Uh, Ephesus was about 120 miles from Ephesus to Colossae. Uh, I have it in my notes, but I think from Laodicea to Colossae was like uh, six miles. And then uh, uh, Hierapolis to Colossae, I think, is like 10 miles. So 
they were all in, you know, a, a reasonable day's travel for people that had to caravan or use the river or, you know, if they had to hike it, you can see it's surrounded by mountains. And we'll get into that a little bit. Actually, if you go into uh, when Jesus was talking about the Laodiceans either be hot or cold, he's talking about the water that would come down through the mountains. And by the time it reached uh, Laodicea, it was uh, lukewarm. Uh, that's a different lesson altogether, but we just wanted to give a little bit more background into, as to uh, the location. And then when we start to get into the city itself, we look at uh, a little background on Colossae. Uh, I'm going to try not to spend too much time here. We just want to spend some time here because uh, we will be uh, talking about this city for probably the next six or, six or eight weeks. So today's lesson was a little bit more uh, introductory. And uh, I'm going to skip this slide because I think that one's out of order. Here you go. Originally, the city of Colossae was part of the kingdom of Pergamum within Pergia in 133 BC. It was given to the Senate of Rome. Colossae was a large commercial center before Paul's day. The valley in which Colossae was located was the ancient Mediterranean world's leading producer of wool, especially black wool and dyed wool, purple and scarlet. The volcanic soil produced excellent pasture land and the chalky water in the dyeing process. Number two, the volcanic activity in and around that area caused the city to be destroyed several times in its history, the last being uh, AD uh, 60. <coughs> Excuse me. Colossae was located, as we mentioned, on the Lycus River Valley, a tributary of the Meander River, which ran by Ephesus 100 miles downstream. In this one valley were several small cities where Epaphras um, started churches. Hierapolis was six miles away, Laodicea 10 miles away, and Colossae uh, being 100, uh, 100 miles away from Ephesus. Uh, the Romans built their major east-west highway via Ignatia, uh, which bypassed Colossae, it dwindled to almost nothing over time. Uh, this was similar to what happened to Petra in the Transjordan area of Palestine. The city was made up mostly of Gentiles. I left this out because uh, we didn't have time today, but I wanted to talk about the makeup. It was mostly Gentiles, but there were numerous Jews also. Josephus tells us that Antiochus III <clears throat> transported 2,000 Jews from Babylon to Colossae. Records show that by AD 76, 11,000 Jewish males lived in the district of which Colossae was the capital. Gnosticism, the primary reason that the Apostle Paul wrote this letter, and I'm almost thankful that the Gnostics had descended on Colossae, not because of their teaching, not because of what was going on, but it... it it aroused something in the Apostle Paul. The Holy Spirit was working in the Apostle Paul, and had it not been for them, we, not, we may not have this beautiful, beautiful letter from the Apostle Paul, because as we know, he was in house arrest, and he just kind of, I mean, I envision him at least, I'm sorry, kind of frantically writing to refute this, this uh, doctrine that was coming in uh, to this city. And so let's look at that a little bit. Gnosticism was perhaps the most dangerous heresy that threatened the early church during the first three centuries. Influenced by such philosophers as uh, Plato, Gnosticism is based on two false premises. First, it espouses a dualism regarding the spirit and matter. Gnostics assert that matter is inherently evil and spirit is good. As a result of this presupposition, Noxus believe anything done in the body, even the grossest sin, has no meaning because real life exists in the spiritual realm only. What does that mean? In other words, if you lived a raggedy life, if you sinned a certain way, if you did something in your natural body, they just said that that had nothing to do with your salvation. It had nothing to do with your salvation. You can sleep with 10,000 prostitutes, you can take drugs, you can do everything because it had nothing to do uh, with your uh, salvation. The second one, Gnostics claim to possess an elevated knowledge, a higher truth known only to a certain few. Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means to know. Gnostics claim to possess a higher knowledge, not from the Bible, but acquired on some mystical higher plane of existence. Gnostics see themselves as a privileged class elevated above everyone else by their higher, deeper knowledge of what? Of God. So there's been a debate are they Christians? Are they not Christians? You know, I didn't really entertain that thought uh, for this lesson. Maybe we'll 
pick up on it a little bit later, but the, the basic concept was is that they knew things about God that you and I couldn't know. And they began to uh, perpetrate that. And so if they had Paul's letter in front of them or they understood the gospel, they could just come in and say, well, no, that's not what that means. This means this. That's not what this means. This means that. So they had this, this sense amongst themselves that they had a higher knowledge. Now, we are reading about it here in Colossians, but it really picks up. And John, because remember, John, if Paul wrote, writes these letters between AD 60 and 62, we know that John wrote his letters around AD 80 or AD 90. So John deals with this because it had grown or expanded by the time that John the Revelator began to write his, his letters. So he deals with it a little bit more head on, but you can see the birth of it. You can see its infancy here in Colossae, and that's why uh, we'll get to that in a minute, but you see some correlation between the Ephesian letter and the Colossian letter because Paul was trying to head off this doctrine uh, before it really got, uh, got too far. Most of our knowledge of this heresy comes from the, from the Gnostic writings of the second century. In other words, they wrote stuff down. However, the incipient ideas were present in the first century. You can find them in the Dead Sea Scrolls. In other words, uh, you remember the Dead Sea Scrolls were not just the uh, scriptures themselves. There were all manners of writings that were discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They happened to include books of the Bible, but there were other things in there, and some of these writings reveal the teachings of the Gnostics. The problem of Colossae number B was a hybrid of Christianity, incipient Gnosticism, and legal Judaism. That's what we're talking about. They took this Greek philosophy, and part of it came out of Judaism, and they had this higher knowledge based on what Plato and Aristotle and guys would say, and they tried to mix it all together and then teach a gospel other than uh, Christ Jesus. Some stated tenets of Valentinian and Cerinthians, Gnostics of the second century, which were as follows. Matter and spirit were co-eternal. Ontological dualism. Matter is evil, spirit is good. God who is spirit cannot be directly involved with the molding evil matter. There are emanations or eons or angelic beings between God and matter. I don't want to get too granular with this, but basically they were trying to describe the substance of Christ Jesus. And in so doing, they were saying that he was not God and that he was lower, but he's, and he's someone to be recognized, but he is not God himself, or he is not um, uh, divine. Some, some sects of them, sex, S-E-C-T-S, believed that he was not divine at all. He was 100% man. And others believed that he was divine, but he wasn't matter. In other words, he wasn't a human being. And so all of these different doctrines crept in, and I'm not going to read all of this because I don't want to get too far, uh, like I said, down into the weeds of it, but they had uh, systems that they began to teach. And so I'm going to go to a summary of it. Uh, the false teachers that had descended on Colossae advocated Greek, what we call metaphysics. Spirit and matter were co-eternal. Spirit of God was good. Matter, which was God's creation, was evil a series of eons, if, if you want to look at that as, as the word literally eon, is, although it's, it's spelled with an A, uh, there were levels, especially in the writings of the Valentinians, existed between a good high God and a lesser God who formed matter. Salvation was based on knowledge of secret passwords supposedly given by Jesus orally to a select group, which enabled people's progress through the angelic levels or eons to get to this high good God. So you can see how their, their uh, teaching, again, was based on Greek philosophy a little bit, and then also some, uh, some tenets of Judaism. And so this was the teaching that we see throughout the letter that Paul is primarily dealing with. But in his dealing with it, Paul is uh, uh, exalting Christ. And he's explaining Christ, and he goes through a very detailed uh, description of who Christ Jesus is, and we'll be getting to that uh, in, in later lessons. So we mentioned how uh, Colossians and Ephesians uh, were very, very much related. Uh, one of them is a personal letter to a group, which obviously is the Colossian letter, and then the Ephesian letter was meant to be a circular letter. 
So Paul, we don't know which one came first, but we know that we're in the same time period while he was on house arrest. And so it's, we just thank the Holy Spirit for us because what we are doing now by going by book, doing these book uh, lessons the way we're doing them, we're going to cover all four chapters of uh, Colossians on verse-by-verse basis, and then we're going to go over and cover all six chapters of Ephesians, also on a verse-by-verse basis. And we know that Ephesians, every line of the Ephesian letter is written to the ecclesia, or the body. It's a very, very much of a, a, a skeletological letter. It's, it's dealing with uh, the, the, body of, the body of Christ. So the letters that we have, again, of the Apostle Paul, why he is in prison, again, this comes off of our verse-by-verse study of the book of Acts. So when we left the book of Acts in Acts chapter number 28, we started off by looking at the four chapters of the Philippian letter. And then uh, we just finished on last week uh, the one chapter. It's just only 25 verses of the letter to Philemon. And then now we're in the Colossian letter, four chapters. And as I mentioned, the Ephesian letter has um, six, six chapters. So when we do a um, comparison contrast or a side-by-side analysis of the Ephesian letter and the Colossian letter. Uh, This is just a partial list, but we see uh, the structure in some of the terms being very similar and in some cases identical, where you will see things like in Ephesians 1, 4 and Colossians 1, 22, holy and blameless. You'll see Ephesians 1, 7 and Colossians 1, 14, redemptive, redemption and forgiveness. Uh, you'll see Ephesians 1.10 and Colossians 1.20, all things heaven and earth. Uh, you'll go down Ephesians 3.3 3 and Colossians 1.26 and 7. He talks about the mystery. So you'll see where the, the letters were uh, written to two different groups. They had two different um, objectives, but the themes were very, very uh, similar. Uh, you'll also see uh, um, things that are dealing with your walk worthy, Ephesians 4.1, Colossians 1.10, the filling of the Spirit, the Word of Christ, Ephesians 5.18, Colossians 3.16. So you'll see a lot of themes that are intermingled, and to me, I believe that that's why you want to uh, look at these letters together. Uh, if you don't look at them together simultaneously, you should do one right after the other. And again, we are going to the Colossian letter first, uh, but then uh, we will be uh, proceeding right into the Ephesian letter. Then there are some letters that we can speak, or that we can see that Paul is kind of speaking to this notion about these levels. Uh, and he's doing that in reference to Christ Jesus because he says some things that are very particular, the fullness of him who fills all in all being filled up to all the fullness of God, to the, full, to the fullness of Christ. For all the fullness to him dwell in him. For in him all the fullness of deity dwell, or God, or the Godhead dwells. So you can see where Paul, once again, is stressing the sufficiency, number one, of Christ Jesus. Well, let me back up. The supremacy, I'm sorry, of Christ Jesus. And because of this supremacy, then we are sufficient in him. Again, it's a very Christological letter. Everything in the Colossian letter is geared towards Christ Jesus, which makes it a beautiful, beautiful letter uh, that the Apostle Paul wrote, even though it's only four chapters. It is just packed. And to be honest, brother, and that's why I apologize to Brother Keith. Uh, this morning, we had intended to, be, to, to look at Colossians chapter 1, verse number 14, and we just cut it all the way back to verse number 4. Just, let's just deal with the introduction today because it's too much, and we don't want to uh, pass anything up. Now, there are some things that also, uh, continuing with uh, uh, Paul's, uh, not really argument, but how he's explaining the uh, uh, you know, the nature of Christ, and then we see the similarities between the Ephesian letter and the Colossian letter. You can see where he, he, he's identifying Christ as the head of the church. He talks about being alienated. He talks about redeeming the time. He talks about being rooted. He's talking about the word of truth, the gospel. He's talking about forbearing. And an unusual phrase that he uses, which is held together or supply, which we find in Ephesians 4.16 and Colossians 2.19. Uh, 
a very, very brief outline of chapter one only. Uh, you know, we didn't want to pile it all on in the first lesson, so we just stopped right there at chapter one. Chapter one is a very beautiful, beautiful uh, letter, a uh, uh, portion of the letter. And again, look how much Paul is stressing Christ, faith in Christ, the preeminence of Christ, reconciliation in Christ, sacrificial service for Christ, in Christ, of Christ, in Christ, for Christ. Paul is really, once again, um, um, teaching or explaining to the people there in Colossae, don't get caught up in all this stuff. Don't get caught up in all this teaching. It's all about Christ. It's all about Christ. And so this is just chapter number one. Uh, as we uh, start to look in, the first two chapters really deal with doctrine, uh, and then the second two chapters kind of deal with your walk and how you should live your life uh, because of the doctrine. So when we go on, uh, again, Colossians chapter 1, verse 1 through 4, we look at the text itself. Uh, there were certain things that jumped out uh, to me, and uh, this is kind of what made me uh, chop off the other 10 verses instead of going down to verse 14. Actually, the heart of chapter number 1, you're going to find it's going to be in verse 17 through 19. Uh, I'm sorry, 15 through 19. That's really going to be the heart of chapter number 1. But when we start off, we are taking ourselves back to the Apostle Paul's condition, that he is on house arrest, that he has been beaten, that he has been shipwrecked, he's been left for dead, he's about to uh, at any, any time now, he's about to get a visit from the guards, tell him he must, he is now his time to present his case before Nero. He's already dealt with uh, 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 Onesimus and Philemon and, uh, you know, all the other things in the Philippian letter. So we're, we're understanding that by the will of God, he is, he's talking about uh, here how God has brought him through, how God has kept him alive, has God has been his sustainer. And I thought that was very important for us to recognize in our own lives if we look at, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the different variants from COVID and, and all of the ills of society and, and you know, racial strife and, and, and all the things going on. But the will of God has kept us. And so there must be a reason why uh, we are still here today. So the will of God is the same introductory phrase that's used in the Colossian letter, I mean, the Corinthian letter, First and Second Corinthian letter, the Ephesian letter, and then Second Timothy. Paul was convinced that God had chosen him to be an apostle. So once again, right off the bat, he's giving credit to God. The special sense of uh, calling started at his Damascus Road conversion. Uh, this opening phrase emphasizes Paul's understanding of his God-given um, authority. Then he says, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ. And I want to give some credit to uh, uh, the late Brother Cobb. Uh, God bless you, Brother. Uh, Brother Cobb, before he passed on, uh, we went up and visited him. In fact, we were at his house and had dinner with him the night before he passed away. But even on his uh, bed of affliction, Brother Cobb never stopped with his faith and never stopped preaching the gospel. And he, would, he, called, he came and I was sitting there with him. He said, Brother Williams, I'm working on a sermon. And I said, oh, yeah, well, Brother Cobb, what you working on? And he took me to this text. And I listened to him, and I, somewhere down in one of the boxes in my office, I have his notes. I haven't read them. But he wanted to talk about saints and faithful brethren. And that wasn't on my mind when we went here, but when I, was, when I recall the conversation with Brother Cobb, he was talking about the nature of the brethren or the brotherhood how there are some that are faithful and some that are not faithful. But let's go back and look at the lesson itself and the way we, we were approaching it was, again, which is a little different. I just want to give him some, some credit for that. Uh, the main word here, obviously, is saints. And we talked about how uh, the Catholics have a system of almost like anointing sainthood. You know, they call it St. John, St. Peter, uh, St. Mark. But when we look at the word itself, when we look at our walk with God, uh, we are all uh, saints. There's no voting. There's no special uh, uh, commencement ceremony for you to become or be called a saint. Uh, the original word in Greek you see there is theologically related to the Old Testament, 
Old Testament term, holy, which implies set apart for God's service. It's always plural, except Philippians chapter 4, verse 21 and 22. And you'll notice a little uh, inversion there. It says, salute every saint, singular, in Christ Jesus. And then here it says, all the saints, plural, salute you. This is the only time you find the word in the New Testament in its singular form. All the other times you find it, it's going to be uh, in the plural. I don't know that that makes a big difference. Uh, but when I started to look at this, and this goes back to our Wednesday class, and uh, this, this past Wednesday we were in the book of Leviticus, and we are talking about the four themes in the book of Leviticus. And one of them was obviously sacrifices. Another one was the holiness of God. And the other one uh, is the holiness of people. And I think the fourth one was offerings. But when we look at this and we begin to see, and this is where I would mention in the lesson today, how many times God talked about you or I or his people being holy. Leviticus 11, 44, 45, For I am the Lord your God, ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defy yourselves with any manner of creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Ye shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Now this, when we read the text in isolation, we say, okay, God, that's nice. But when we study it, we see that God says it over and over and over and over and over. So now, me, I have to step back and say, okay, wait a minute, God. Obviously, I can read this verse, but since you repeated this so many times, what are you trying to tell me? Well, what are you trying to say? Obviously, God is saying something to us because Peter quotes this. But God is saying, look, there is a way that I want you to be. There's a way I want you to live. There's a way I want you to operate. There's a way I want you to think. There's a way I want you to deal with people. There's a way that you are supposed to be if you are going to be a saint. So once again, Leviticus 19, 1 and 2, and the Lord spake to Moses, saying, Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I am. The Lord your God am holy. Let's continue. Leviticus chapter number 20, verse number 7. Sanctify yourselves therefore and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 26. And ye shall be holy unto me, for I am the Lord am holy and have uh, severed you from the other people or taken you out or, or, or split you up from the other people that you should be what? Mine. Leviticus 21.8. Thou shalt sanctify him, therefore, for he offereth the bread of thy God. He shall be holy unto thee, for I, the Lord, would sanctify you, am holy. Now let's transverse another 38 years. We get into Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 38, I mean 23, 14. For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of thy camp to deliver thee and to give up thine enemies before thee. Therefore shall thy camp be holy, that he see no unclean in thee, and turn away from thee. Obviously, when we get to Colossians, notice this is towards the end of chapter number one, but it's still in the book of Colossians, chapter number one, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, ye now have been, have you yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through, through death to present you holy and unblameable, unreprovable in his sight, in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his uh, sight. And then again down in Colossians 3, verse 12 and 13, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness, a humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against you, even as Christ forgave you, so you also do him. And then we find again in Ephesians chapter number 1, verse 3 and 4. I won't read that again for the sake of time uh, because there's more we want to get into. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 10. Obviously, we know this very well. 
uh, and it's talking about how we should be holy, but not only that, but we should be ordained, that she would walk in certain ways. Same thing with Ephesians chapter number 4, verse number 1, and chapter number 5, uh, verse number is 27. Now, we looked at, by the will of God, then we looked at to the saints, and let's talk for a minute about faithful brethren. I would like to, if we can, have some time for some, uh, some open discussion. Faithful brethren. Okay, I did not get the rest of my passages in there on that. Okay, so faithful brethren was one, and then in Christ was the next one. So with these two, I think the idea was I wanted to uh, open it up to, to the class a little bit to talk about faithful brethren and in Christ. Faithful brethren and in Christ. So let's start with an open discussion. What does being a faithful brother mean to you? And the second thing is what does it mean to be in Christ? What does it mean to be in Christ? Anyone have any thoughts or comments on that? If not, we can certainly proceed uh, because we've got a little bit more to go. But D. Um, I was going to say um, a faithful brother in Christ, a faithful brethren in Christ is a brother or sister who is unmovable, mm-hmm. um, who's not tossed to and fro mm-hmm. with every wind of doctrine, who mm-hmm. fully commits yes. to the word of God. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And then there was another question you asked after that, I believe. Oh, just uh, about the, the aspect of being in Christ. Uh, being being in Christ, mm-hmm. well, for one, we know in Galatians they say, in order to be in Christ, we have to be baptized into Christ. Amen. All right. Mm-hmm. And so, and then we are to live our lives faithfully mm-hmm. and continue to abide in the Word of God mm-hmm. um, until at the end of time for mm-hmm. our, for ourselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yes, in Christ. Yes, yes. In Christ is a positional thing where you are no longer of the world. You're no longer in the world. You're not a, you're not a product of the world. You are in Christ. Christ has you. As the Apostle Paul was uh, common as saying people are uh, fellow servants, or he would say, I'm in these bonds or I'm in these chains for Christ because the Apostle Paul knew that once he gave his life over to Christ Jesus, there were certain things that he couldn't do anymore. Even though he struggled with them, Romans chapter number 7, every time I want to do good, who is right there with me? Evil was right there with it. He struggled with it, but he was a prisoner of Christ. He was in these bonds because God had a certain mission and purpose for his life, and that's the same thing with each and every one of us. When we go down in that watery grave of baptism, when we accept Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we, something happens. We're, we're, we're not the same. It might be subtle, and it might take a little while to really hit you, but you're not the same anymore. Something happened. Number one, the Holy Spirit is working with you. So now, all of a sudden, you know, you're not getting all those little crazy signs and signals in your head. Or, you know, if you do, that's your own lust, that's your own desires. But God is always there with you, trying to pull you and prod you along. What else would be a factor in being a faithful brother? Amen. Studying God's word. Anybody else? I I was just going to say that when we look at faithful, Mm -hmm. even when we just look at it in anything, Mm -hmm. it's like, here, look, he faithfully gets up every day Mm -hmm. and goes to work and Mm -hmm. do what he needs. So in one sense, it's someone who's reliable. It's someone who's true. Mm-hmm. It's one, one, two. So we understand that when we're talking about faithful here, mm-hmm. this is someone who is true to God. Mm-hmm. This is someone who is faithful to God. That mm-hmm. Not that we, you know, in our sense that we are perfect. Yes. But I hold on mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. my faith and my belief in mm-hmm. God uh, and his son and mm-hmm. who they are. Yes. And, and holding on to what it is that, 
he's, he has taught me. So we see from that, Abraham by his works. So it's not just a, something I just say, because mm -hmm. at some point it's demonstrated. Mm -hmm. You know, as mm -hmm. I use that first example, mm -hmm. one says he faithfully gets up and go to work. Isn't, it, it, it's like, because it, it takes an action mm -hmm. of me doing something. Mm -hmm. So my faith is demonstrated from my actions in which I do. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Uh, Brother Keith will get you in just a second. Now my memory is coming back where Brother Cobb was talking about. Brother Cobb was saying, Brother Williams, you have, he said, Brother Williams, you have brethren, then you have faithful brethren. You have brethren, Again, not dealing with your salvation. But every brother is not faithful. And he says, faithful brethren. And he was going in a direction to contrast between those two. Where, that's my brother. But brother man needs some work. Not that we're all that. Not that we're special. No, no, no. It's not what he's saying. But he was just wondering or trying to extrapolate some thoughts as to why Paul used a, uh, uh, I don't know if there's a pronoun or an adjective. Don't Y'all don't take me back to grammar school right now. But one of them modifies the verb. Yeah, adjective. Okay. He's using an adjective here. He's just not talking about brethren. He says faithful. And I believe, and this is where we and Brother Cobb, when we did talk about, were saying, was that Paul was talking to a specific group. Because everybody in Colossae wasn't going to get this. But the ones that could teach and could carry this message and were faithful to Christ Jesus and knew where they were in Christ Jesus, let me write this to them so that they can go ahead and teach and help other people. Faithful brethren. Brother Keith. Uh, quick question. Oh, I'm sorry. Go what ahead. The, what's the difference uh, for baptism between the Roman Catholic uh, aspect of baptism and the Christianity way? Oh, that's an excellent question. <laughs> I, I would like to actually sit down and study with you on that. Uh, it's a little bit off, off topic uh, right now, but I would love to sit down and study with you about that. I'm going to take you back over to the book of Acts and make sure that uh, what you believe at the time of your baptism is in line with Scripture. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a broad statement, but okay. that's, where I would, that's where we will start. But we'll definitely uh, talk about that a little bit offline because it's a little bit off of where we're at right now. Uh, but I want to talk to you afterwards, okay? Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Brother Keith. Well, you got to the point that I was getting ready to ask about faithful brethren mm -hmm. and who Paul was talking to at that time. He wasn't talking, like you said, to the church of Ephesus, that meaning the whole mm -hmm. body or congregation. He was talking to Pacific, yes. you know, people in the body of Colossae. Like he, he said, saints. He, he's not saying uh, just anyone and everyone. He's saying faithful brethren. Mm -hmm. And that, that, right, that statement right there is, is saying a lot. He's talking to the brothers that are helping the kingdom of God move along. That's right. I believe. That's I right. believe the ones that are studying and producing the word of God to its mm -hmm. fullest. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, he even mentions Timothy. Mm hmm you know, he's, he's talking to those that, like, like the red part says, in Christ. Mm -hmm. And being in Christ means walking like Christ. Amen. Thinking like Christ. Amen. Acting Amen. like Christ. Amen. You know, mm -hmm. me, me and Brother Dash was talking out here a little earlier about you could have caught me a couple of years ago and you couldn't step on my toe. <laughs> 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 you know, help us, Lord. <laughs> and, and, I'm with and, you, though, brother. And, and but now, since I'm in Christ, you know, uh, I can look at you and say, "That's all right, brother." Yeah. Pass you yeah. on your shoulder. Yeah. And and it, I take it a step further. You could also say that some people consider being a follower of Christ a weakness. Mm. They say, "Oh, oh," but I found that in the Bible or those that are in 
Christ, there's not one single solitary one that was weak. Mm-hmm. They might have been weak in sin, but God has, who God has chosen to pick up that mantle, there was none that were weak. They Come were on, all Keith. victorious. They were all strong. Come they on, were Keith. all they were they were all godly at the Come end. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. So there's no weakness. And me and me and Dash kind of kind of jumped up in the air a little bit on that one because <laughs> there's no weakness in Christ. Amen. You know, Amen. And, and when you when you say that, you you know that God has given us the tools to overcome. Everything and anything, Amen. really. Amen. Yes, yes. Strength in weakness. I think we talked about that quite a bit. Uh, sometimes it's so easy to lash out and respond, particularly if we allow our emotions to overcome us. But sometimes the hardest thing to do is to hold on to your Christian values. When somebody is attacking you, somebody's belittling you, somebody's screaming in your face. You know, you got to pray, you got to hold on, because that other dude that's back in there somewhere, he's ready to pull out the brass knuckles and, you know, go to work. And so, <laughs> no, it is not a weakness. It's actually a superb strength uh, to, to keep your, your fleshly desires in check. And our temperance, that's where I was going, uh, 2 Timothy chapter number 1, verse number 7, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but what? Power and what? Love, what's the third thing, Sister Steve? And a sound mind. And in, in some versions, like Sister D said, that word is temperance. So I can't, I'm going to use this phrase, but I can't be bugging out every time somebody steps on my toe, like Brother Keith said. Every time someone offends me, I can't just lose my cool because my mind is fixed on Jesus, and that's where I'm at in my positional standing. But Jim? Yeah, I just, <clears throat> I believe that when Paul, when he addressed that letter, he, he gave those, those faithful brothers encouragement because he distinctly talked to them, to you faithful brothers. Amen. So they knew who they were. Yes. And the ones that wasn't faithful, they knew who they were too also. That's right. So when, when that letter was addressed, oh, so you, you, we've been recognized. We're, mm-hmm. we are, we are, we, whatever we're doing, we're doing right. And Paul recognized us because right. he's addressing us. And these, these brothers over here are not acting right. They're set aside. He's pointing them out too. Yeah. Just by addressing the faithful brothers, yep. he's dressed the ones that's unfaithful. That's right. And then it's not just to them, it's to us today. Amen. That, Amen. that letter goes to the same as us faithful brothers and those that's right. who's not unfaithful. So we're looking at the history of them, but we were in the present. It's talking about us too. You know, uh, again, there's, there's a lot of uh, people that believe that the Colossian letter could have been written to uh, uh, us today. And, and it really... There's a lot of parallels when we really start getting into it, particularly because of the subject nature that Paul is dealing with, with Gnosticism, and then the way he responds by shining a light on Christ Jesus, by bringing the whole conversation back to what God was doing, and especially when we get into terms like he, he's going to call him the firstborn, he's going to talk about sufficiency and supremacy. He starts touching on some things that kind of make us step back for a minute and say, wait a minute. I'm listening to all these doctrines. I'm listening to all this stuff. Let's keep the main thing the main thing. The main thing is Christ Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. But Dash. Now I was going to say, and the beautiful thing about it, like we kind of talked about, is everybody possesses the ability and opportunity to become a saint or a faithful brother or sister. And then kind of going further in that verse, look at the access we have when you become a faithful brother or a saint, the go grace ahead, go and go peace. ahead and read it, bro. So it says, which are Colossae, grace be unto you and peace mm-hmm. from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. And so I was thinking, if you don't put forth the effort, you don't work towards becoming a faithful brethren, it's gonna be hard for you to understand the peace and the grace of God. Yeah. Wow, man, you just see you, bro Dash just blew it open. <laughs> He's absolutely right, especially when we start going down into verse number five and start picking up, because it's like Paul starting with this introduction where we're at. But brothers, he starts picking up steam, and he just keeps going and keeps going, and that's why I was struggling. As we mentioned, we were originally going to go to verse 14, and I just, someone was telling me that that's too much. Just cut, cut it back, cut it back. Let's focus on these four, first four verses, and then we will, uh, we will continue. So very good. Very good comments. So we talked about how 
does a saint prove they are saved or prove they are a saint? This is a rhetorical question. Obviously, it's just meant to provoke thought. Uh, but one of them is by our obedience. John chapter number 14, verse number 15 says, if you love me, what? You keep my commandments. And that's, it's, it's a, it's a, it, it has taken the position almost as a cliche. But if you really stop and think about it, Jesus says so much in that text. If you love me, if conditional. Remember we talked about that word if. Sometimes you can change it to say since. Since you love me, you will keep my commandments. But that's not what he said. He says if. In other words, if you go around professing that you love me, keep my commandments. So he's talking about obedience here. And then um, that was John 14, 15. Uh, and then Romans 6, 16, uh, know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. <clears throat> James 1, 22, but be ye doers of the word and not what? Hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Lord, have mercy. I just got a little shakes right there just reading that. Deceiving your own self. Lord, have mercy. Jesus, pray for us all. Matthew 7, 21, we know this verse well. Not, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that, what? There's an obedience factor in it. He that doeth the will of my Father, which is in uh, heaven. Isaiah 1, 19, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat of the good of the land. Romans 12, 9, which is one we used in the lesson today. This is one of those buried gems in the text that I just love this text. Uh, again, it says, let love be without dissimulation. Uh, that uh, word, we know dissimulation, also means what? Hypocrisy. Let love be without hypocrisy. Don't be a hypocrite with your love. If you're going to love, love hard and let God deal with it. But don't be a hypocrite with your love. So that is one way uh, that we show uh, that we are uh, saved. Yeah, or a saint, I'm sorry. The other one is holiness, as we mentioned before. This is where uh, Peter is quoting Moses. Uh, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your minds, being sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you holy, going back to Leviticus, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. That is another way that a saint can prove uh, who they are or that they are a saint. The third one was in love. Uh, 1 John 3, 14. Um, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love who? The brethren. Same audience that the Apostle Paul is writing to. We love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abided in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we, we the love of God. We pre, hereby we, okay, stop. <laughs> hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. 1 John 4, 16, and we know and we have known and believed the love that God hath for us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Whoa, that's powerful. <clears throat> and we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Ephesians 4, 2, with all loneliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another, in love. Colossians 3.14 and Proverbs 
three through four. I won't read those for the sake of time because the final point that we looked at uh, this, this morning was uh, they prove it by their works. We are not, we don't work to be saved, and I'm not, you know, uh, um, minimizing obedience. That's not what we're saying here. You must be obedient because we already went to that. That was the very first one. So what we're talking about now is once God has saved you, once God has blessed you, once God has given you uh, this second chance on life, you ought to do some works. There's things that we ought to do, not because we're trying to prove ourselves holy, not because we're trying to pop our collar with the world, not because we want to be seen by men, but because of the love and the holiness and obedience that is now embodied in our walk. And because it's embodied in our walk, you could change this word works to fruit. And I like to take the word fruit and change that to evidence. It's, it's, they're, they're similar terms. There should be some fruit or there should be some evidence. A lot of times we think of fruit and we think of, oh, how big is your church? Or, you know, how many baptisms did you have this year? No, that's a, a warped concept of fruit. The fruit here is what you exude out of your life. How does the world see Christ in you? How are you acting? And let God worry about everything else. But the fruit or the evidence that God is with you. Brother Jim. Yeah, and just, <clears throat> just look at those, uh, those, those saints, those brothers that was doing their work. You know, it's probably outnumbered with those Noxic guys and you know, they're trying to tell the truth, and they, they get this, this other lies coming, you know, contradicting what they're saying. But they kept on, kept on. So you see the Holy Spirit with Paul to write that letter, but the Holy Spirit with them too. And because of the labor of their fruit, here come the letter from Paul to give them a shot in the arm. You guys doing the right thing. They probably just got even more bold, mm -hmm. you know, and everything. And, and, and this, like I said, that goes to us too. We might, we might be in a small congregation, or a big congregation, you might have a few brothers, but some good brothers that, that's bearing fruits. And you, and, you, and, you, and you keep the congregation going on the right track versus, like you said, a big church with a lot of members, but you're kind of raggedy in there, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, and you, you'll see it too. So um, the Holy Spirit is with us here today, and he, and he shows those, he shows the fruits of our labor too, you know. And you'll know it when you, when you see it because he's going to make sure that you know it, just like that letter. They knew that, it was, they, that, that Paul was there with them, and he was caring for them, and they kept on keeping on. Because that, I can imagine, like it says, it was outnumbered, you know, and everything. Satan's everywhere trying to keep, keep them down and probably put them, you know, going against these guys and talking them down and people, you know, saying things they, saying it wasn't true or whatever, but it, whatever was going on. But it, they, kept, they, they kept the spirit up and, and, uh, and, and kept it going. So just like us. Yes, I agree, Jim. I thought that this, knowing the context was helpful to us and me uh, because it, it allowed me to kind of peer or us to peer a little bit into Paul's mindset as to who he was writing to, why did he write the letter, and what was the theme or message that he was trying to get over to the, on the letter. And I agree with you, this opening uh, first four verses seems to me like it would be very, very encouraging. If, if I was in a mist and there was, a, you know, I don't, I don't want to say bandits or robbers, but I'm trying to think of a term to describe these people. If they were constantly in your town, in the marketplace, talking to your kids, and then you get a, a, such an encouraging letter from the Apostle Paul, who at that time, as the uh, Ephesian letter said, was known all over Asia. And that's, well, I didn't touch on that, but if you go back in the book of Acts, uh, uh, there were several times where it says that the, this message, this gospel that Paul was preaching was spread all over the Asia. And in fact, one place, it was, it was all over the whole world is what the, the wording was. But you get this letter from the Apostle Paul, and not only does he encourage you in the first, first four verses, but when you go through the rest of the letter, he starts giving you doctrinal points to refute all of this false teaching. And so I can imagine, I, I don't, I mean, I don't want to add to the script, but I can imagine brothers getting huddled around this letter and they studying it, Brother Dash. They studying this letter, Jim, and, and they're saying, okay, now, you know, I know these guys are going to come back to the marketplace next week. 
So let's get a little bit more sharper. Let's, let's take Paul's letter. Let's go back into the scripts that we have, the Old Testament scripts, and let's see some of these concepts that were lar largely in the law. And let's see what Paul is talking about with this Messiah, because we know who the Messiah is even without going to the Old Testament scripts. But since or if Jesus was the Messiah, then what does that mean? Going back to the supremacy and going back to the sufficiency and not allowing this false doctrine to di dilute, excuse me, the blood of Christ, to water down the blood of Christ or water down the gospel. So this, again, was a kind of an introductory lesson. We're, we're out of time right now. We're actually two minutes over. So we're going to go ahead and stop right here. I appreciate everybody coming out and providing comments. Uh, I want to ask if there are any prayer requests. Brother Christian, uh, thank you for your wonderful question. I would like to uh, chat with you tonight, if we can, after class. Uh, I also want to just pray for everyone. I just so much enjoy uh, Tiffany's little baby. Uh, I, I'm sorry about that, guys, but this is two weeks in a row when I've been, I've been speaking. I look out, and she's bobbling her head, but she's staring at me. You know, <laughs> Hey, mommy. <laughs> uh, but, you know, pray for them and pray for everybody. Uh, does anybody have any prayer requests? Sister D, do you have any prayer requests, sis? Amen. Pray for her and her family. Anyone else? Anyone else have any prayer requests? I want to pray for Derek, uh, my son. He's, uh, some of you know that he's serving the country, and he just happens to be in a state that's in the middle of a blizzard right now. They are almost pretty much snowed in, and so we just pray for him and his safety, Brother, Brother T. I was just going to add on to what you were saying because it made me think about the weather, uh, how back in the east, you know, they're suffering through this weather. Uh, my niece and her husband, they just went back to North Carolina, mm -hmm. and it snowed yesterday. So okay. Uh, okay. keep them in prayer that they will, uh, when they decide to come back this way, that they'll mm -hmm. have a safe mm -hmm. travel. Amen. Um, but just all of them, even what we've just seen, you know, because of the weather, all the accidents and things, so mm -hmm. just... Pray that uh, things will subside because it just seems like all these tragedies are stacking up on top of each other. Amen. You got a flood, you got a hurricane, you yes, got a, yes. this, and, and, and hopefully from this, it will cause some to be mindful to remember God. Amen. You know, so hopefully some of these things bring them back uh, mm -hmm. that we understand that life is short mm -hmm. and, and where do we want to spend eternity? So uh, just... Uh, Keep all our brothers and sisters in Christ as well as this world and the things that we've gone through within these last two years. Amen. 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 Anyone else? But Jim. Sister Nancy, yes. Please pray for Sister Nancy. Obviously, we want to pray for our beloved sister Paula. I continue to pray for her and just all the saints uh, everywhere. Uh, so um, I want to like, just go ahead and close this in a word of prayer, okay? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, so much for uh, what you have done, and we thank you, Father, for sending your Son and for what he did on that cross, Father, and how he suffered so cruelly, and how he just took all the punishment, Father, took all the, the lashing out from the people that uh, crucified him, Father, just a horrible experience for him, Father, on that cross, but we know, Father, that he did it for us. He did it for all of us, Father, whether we be white or brown or Hispanic or Asian or, you know, it doesn't matter, Middle Eastern. It doesn't matter who and what we are as far as our origin, Father, but we were all created in your image, and you, your desire was for all of us to have a way to come back into fellowship with you uh, from the fall of the garden, Father. And so we just thank you for providing that way for us. Uh, we just like to, Father, ask that you be with all the churches of Christ uh, and all those that are striving to do your will, Father. Father, we'd like to pray, Father, also for the first responders, the police officers, the nurses, the fire departments, the military personnel, people that are allowing us to worship in freedom here in this country, Father. We also pray for those, Father, that are living in distant lands, Father, that may not have the protections and the civil liberties that we have here in the United States, Father, we ask that you uh, continue to be with them and, and just protect them, Father, and allow them to remain courage, encouraged in your word, Father. And if there's any way that we might be an example, Father, we just hope that in some way someone is blessed 
uh, by the various uh, things that are happening here at Palomar, Father. Uh, Father, we also want to pray for individuals, Father. Uh, we know that uh, little Tiffany has a small child, Father. We pray for this small baby. We pray, Father, for our sister Duncan, Father, uh, and her family, Father, for strength and encouragement, Father. Uh, as Brother Tony mentioned, Father, there are so many people just dealing with weather and Omicron and loss of jobs and finances and stress and worry and marital issues, Father. It's just very difficult times, Father. So we pray for all of them, Father. Specifically, we pray for them to hold on, but more than just holding on, Father, we pray that they develop a relationship and a desire to want to know more about you, Father, and what you did by sending your son. And the ultimate goal for them would be to be baptized and give their lives over to you. Father, we just thank you for all that you have done and all you continue to do. And we say this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.